Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the podcast. I'm here today with uh, my old friend Rob Henderson, and we are going to talk about the 1970 movie uh, Patton. Uh, how are you doing today, Rob? I'm good, Richard. Looking forward to this conversation. I like this movie. Yeah, you like the movie. Yeah, I, I think, I, yeah, I liked it too. And we, I, 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 I actually first heard of the movie. Maybe I'd heard about it before, but I didn't start thinking about it until I was reading Nixon Land. Um, and then apparently it was Richard, one of Richard Nixon's favorite movies. He would watch it over and over again. Um, mm. There's, did you, uh, did you check out Nixon Land? Did you at least get those parts? Yeah, yeah, I, I skimmed through uh, some of the, some of the sections where they talked about about Patton and found it found it pretty interesting. Yeah. And then there's the other, and then, and then later in the book, it mentioned again, because like Mao and Joe and Lai were watching Patton to like understand America, apparently, uh, when Nixon, <laughs> when Nixon went to China. So if you, yeah, if you control F Patton, like that'll probably yeah. be the last, uh, the last. I saw that. I saw that come up. Yeah. That was interesting. I mean, like, yeah, I just wonder like how, how often these countries, you know, try to understand America through, through our movies and our media. And in, in that time, you know, like, was that like an accurate depiction of 1970 America? Like, I, maybe for Nixon, but yeah. not for the country as a whole, I don't think, right? Like that sort of raw, raw patriotic spirit depicted in the film. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was so overt that um, that the critics, to me, like what I was reading about, it, the critics seemed confused. Like the, the critics liked it because they thought it was a satire. But yeah. the way I understood it was that the movie was made in all sincerity, right? Like it was an earnest to like they weren't trying to like um uh, make some kind of clever subtle commentary about like you know the brutality of war or that yeah. like you know conquering mindset of this evil guy it was like no they, like they, they wanted to sort of depict Patton in all his glory yeah and so so it's confused I mean I think what's confuses people is so the opening the opening is like Patton given some kind of speech or something and uh it's um you know you could find this on youtube we'll link to it the, the 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 opening speech and like Patton is just like you know like oh we're gonna go to the germans and we're gonna rip out their guts you know it's like so over the top like it looks like just like to a, grease uh, the treads on our tanks like yeah <laughs> and so and so apparently in the 19 in the early 1970s like yeah there were some liberals who were like oh this is a great parody of like you know the brutality of war and this is going on during vietnam um mm. and then uh and then there's people like nixon who who love the movie um have you have you seen the uh have you um have you done research on like the like the actual intent of the directors uh no no i mean i read a couple of reviews of the movie and an interview but but yeah i wasn't my my understanding at least based on the reviews which which maybe maybe misguided was that uh they they wanted to to sort of uh build like this this movie as like a monument or an homage to Patton. Is that is yeah. that right? Or I think that's I think I mean my impression from the movie is like, yes, that that, that is what they were doing. Uh I don't know for sure, but yeah, I mean I, I think so. I don't think in America in nineteen seventy you're you're critical of World War Two. Like I don't think like the anti even the anti war people they were were very critical of World War Two. Um so it would be a strange hmm. way to talk about Vietnam by going after World War II. So let's, like, let's tell people like the story of Patton. So basically he starts in North Africa. Uh, he goes like through Tunis and then Morocco. And then he goes up through uh, uh, to Sicily. And then he fights on mm. Sicily for a while. Uh, and then he's like relieved because like, you know, whatever, he's got differences with the with the army. And then finally they uh, he leads um, the forces from, uh, from uh, France. Um, mm. To, to Germany, right? Um, and so that's basically that's the broad outlines of that's broad outlines of Patton's military career, and the car, and the basically the the movie just covers that. Um, and you know, I, I thought the uh, yeah, I mean, the, the opening was interesting. I thought the um, you know, I loved when he when he slapped. <laughs> so so the, the so the scene yeah. is you know he slapped a so yeah. This is these are the reasons why I think it's like it's it's not supposed to be. Uh, 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 like a parody of Patton. So he he slaps a soldier, right? Um, and then like because the soldier because there's like a field hospital and yeah. they're all they're all like you know they have like what Patton considers real real injuries. And then one is like, just sir, I can't take it, my nerves. And he just says, what the hell is wrong with you? Like, stop disgracing these you know these warriors with your presence. Like a yellow bellied coward, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like send him was... to the front. Like he demands he goes to the front. The front lines, <laughs> yeah. He slapped and him then... a couple of times and. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. And then this is based on, I mean, this is based on a, just a true story that he, uh, then he had to, and then like, there was, this was an outcry in the US and yeah. this was even, you know, 43 or 44. 
Uh, so even back then, it was like, you know, I would have thought America maybe in, in that time, like, would have, like, taken pens. And apparently they did. I mean, like, so what happened, so, like, in the, there's a scene in the movie where he's getting letters, and all the letters are like, yeah, Patton, you're in awesome. In support of him. Yeah. But then even, but then the elites are not. Like, Eisenhower is saying, like, this is, you know, this is uh, unbecoming or, you know, not. Yeah, not yeah, it's barbaric or it's, yeah, I, I found that fascinating. I would have never guessed that even back, like, Eisenhower, who was a, a general, um and he, he himself was like sort of known to be like very sort of patriotic and whatever like i would have never guessed that he would you know care that much about you know another general slapping a private around and calling him a coward and whatever like during during the height of the war right like they were in europe like you know bodies piling up around them and the best general like you know whatever is a little bit rough with a private and uh yeah, I mean, it was interesting, like the the movie portrayed him as um, sort of begrudgingly giving an apology. Yeah. Uh, but apparently in real life, Patton uh, ex- like expressed like legitimate remorse and like, you know, so so that was like an interesting contrast between uh, the movie's depiction of, of Patton and then in real life. Like, I think he did, yeah. at least my understanding was that he did like actually regret sort of slapping this kid around. But yeah, like even back then there was this sort of sensitivity, this difference, right, between the the, the people who were like, yeah. you know, all in support of Patton and then the elites and the sort of political leaders and the journalists who were like pressuring him to apologize and how, how could you treat this kid this way and whatever. And uh, I, I would have never guessed like 70 years ago, things were still like that 80 years yeah. ago. So apparently one guy in America was executed for desertion during World War II. Uh mm-hmm. So uh, it was the only, they said he was a used to a soldier and the only American soldier to be court-martialed, his name was Edward Slovak, court-martialed and executed for desertion since the American Civil War. So I thought there was, wasn't there, um, wasn't there Americans executed for desertion in World War, in World War I? Uh, uh, that sounds familiar, but yeah, I, I'm not familiar. Like in the U, uh, so the, the British executed 300, but it doesn't, it looks like not the Americans. Um, so it says, yeah, it says this guy, uh, Eddie Slovak was the only, poor guy. I mean, one guy in the whole war is the only guy executed for cowards. How bad must he? How bad must he have been? Uh, for, for desertion, is that why? Yeah, he was. Um, uh, let's it's see. Pre- yeah, just uh, presumably he wasn't the only one, right? Like there must have been. Well, there a must lot have been other people who, who, were, yeah, who, who were deserting, right? Because there was a draft and like. Yeah. You know. Well, there were forty-nine yeah. death sentences. His was the only one that was carried uh, carried out. It says. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean the so but the, the British apparently executed three hundred during World War One, and it looks like the Americans I think executed nobody. They they ex- I heard of American soldiers actually got executed for rape um, of like Native women and uh and uh they're, they're, I was reading I was looking at Native women and, where in, uh, in, in, in North in North Africa. Uh, so oh, there was right. a. There was a, uh, the, I read in Patton's, he like promised like the Sultan of Morocco or somebody, some leader that he was like going to execute any, any rapists. Uh, so he put that in his memoirs. I look at his memoirs. He, it's just him and his like, you know, reflections on his time in war. Um, yeah. So I, did they ever do it? Did, let me, let me look this up too, because I, I wonder if, did I just read Patton say that or did they actually do it? Uh, U.S. execute rape World War II. I vaguely that. recall that this was going on. Like it was, it was known that that if you were an American, yeah, 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 a lot of people got executed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, there was a lot of guys who got executed. Uh, yeah, uh, all these soldiers were executed for murder or rape. So like, yeah, ex- mm. there was uh, there's dozens of them listed on. on a little uh, different from uh, from the Eastern Front, where the Russians were were didn't didn't have the same policy. Yeah, where uh, Stalin said, you know, they're yeah. we're too hot, we're too hard I, on our boys, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah, someone's someone's doing the raping, I guess, and, and, and it was the Russians. That's funny. So, so this is an interesting. This is an interesting aspect of American culture at the time. They're willing to execute men for for rape. And you know, the Supreme Court, the, 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 there was a case in Georgia where, like, you know, mm-hmm. if you left it up to, to like dem- legislators, like you 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 execute child molesters at the state level. And Georgia used to do this, but then the Supreme Court said it was like cruel and unusual punishment, so you couldn't use the death penalty for a uh, for a child rapist. Um, mm. and so the, the courts are the ones like preventing us from executing rapists and child rapists at this point, yeah, who, a lot of states probably would, um, you know, if they could. Um, so, but in world war two, they are willing to execute, uh, men for rape. Um, yeah. and it was murder. a different time. Yeah. yeah but not was, slap was... them for being shell shocked. See, that's, that's yeah. the interesting, that's the interesting, uh, uh, you know, discrepancy. 
Well, well, wait, what is, what is the discrepancy here exactly? I mean, you know, for being shell shocked, of course, I don't think, yeah. But it's, no, no, they, I don't think you should execute them for shell. Look, I, I think there's a correlation between cultural attitudes where like okay. your, your, your liberal use of the death penalty and then not being sympathetic towards like uh, mental disorders or people having like mental. Well, suffering. I think they were sympathetic towards him, right? Because they, but they, they were pressured. Yeah, they were. To, right. That's what I'm saying. Were, yeah. I, I would have expected them. I would have expected them not to be. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that is, okay, that's kind of interesting. There is, a, uh, I guess, somewhat of a mismatch because you think that if they were sort of hard on, like like willing to yeah. like uh, execute, then they would also be sort of maybe less. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so there's just a, like a, a, an inconsistent sensitivity there for different kinds of people. Yeah, because there's a sensitivity mm. like, oh, no, you, like the death penalty seems harsh. So people who don't like are, are against the death penalty tend to be big and like, wellness, mental illness, microaggressions, you know, whatever. These, these things all correlate with each other pretty strongly at the individual level. Uh, yeah. At the back time. then, like, yeah, I wonder if like any of these, you know, the sort of modern tools of social science and like trying to understand political attitudes, like if any of like, could this really be applied back then in the 1940s, just a completely different era, different time. So have you like ever seen war. Babylon, Ber Ber uh, Babylon Ber Berlin? I've seen a few episodes. Okay. Well, I, I've, um, so this is not going to give it, I don't think this gives away much from the, for the plot. Uh, I stopped watching like the last season. They'd be sort of be the, the storyline became sort of crazy. Uh, but before, but before that there was like, so it takes place in, uh, like 1930s or 1920s, late 1920s, 1920s mid, uh, Germany. Germany. And there's this one scene where this guy is trying to, he's like a, he's like a professor or a psychiatrist. I think he's giving a lecture about the poor men who are shell shocked from world war one. Mm -hmm. um and then like everyone in the crowd just starts yelling at him you are like you know like they call him basically like an apologist for these cowards and like nobody <laughs> should have any sympathy for these cowards who should just go die oh, right man. and this is germany you know in the 1920s uh it's so it's so different now man like yeah, yeah. so so yeah the attitude i mean so so today I, I i don't know like do you think that that would have happened in the 1920s in the u.s uh well, if I, some, I, I would have said you know... i would have said they wouldn't have had the sympathy but i i don't I don't know because they, if they weren't willing to execute deserters in World War One, it makes me think that they were a little more sympathetic to like human frailty, right? Um, so yeah, Germany, I, I mean, they I literally know, pressured I, Patton to apologize, right? Like yeah. Patton slapped a shell shock soldier, soldier, and they they were uh, sort of on the side of the soldier and not on the side of Patton, right? Because they made right. him apologize. Well, the pe yeah, the people. The people, yeah, yeah. right? And probably Germany, actually, in the 1920s, probably. I mean, it depends on who the government was. Like the the, the Weimar uh, government was probably like this psychiatrist, um, you know, those, those like socialist and left leading governments. While the people, so maybe the people in the U.S. and and Germany were the same, but the elites just happened to be different at different times. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I think you get like, I th yeah, I think with Roosevelt, that's what like FDR, you start to get like something resembling like modern liberal elite, like you get something resembling like the managerial elite, they're, they're, you know, they're progressive on race, they're limited in what they can do, but they're like, they're like, uh, they're, they're, pro they're progressive, at least in their hearts on, on most racial things. And then like mm -hmm. Eleanor Roosevelt is like sort of the first like national figure to be woke on women. Uh, and then you have like labor and so you have you have expansion of government and so i don't know if like psych so like psychiatry i guess maybe was like sort of creeping into like the way elites were uh th you know thinking about thinking about things um but yeah but the reason nixon loves this because this is what's happening during vietnam basically during vietnam you have like like my understanding like public opinion is pretty divided but like there's a portion of public opinion like about a third so the elites are debating whether to like stay the course or like get out but like there's a portion of public opinion, like a third, that just wants to nuke the place, just wants to like, you know, just do whatever it takes to, to win. Um, and so that, 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 that view is like not represented very well among elites, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think when Nixon is watching that, he's seeing, you know, he's, he's, he's seeing basically himself. He's the, he's the you know, the, the man of the people. It's not just Vietnam, but it's also like, you know, on race and crime and all these other issues that, you know, Nixon is the, Nixon is the greatest beneficiary. Sort of big man. Right, like the great man, the big man, who's uh, who gets things done. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think like well, and Nixon himself, if I recall correctly, I mean, he, I know he was in the Navy during World War II, and it, he was he was fairly well decorated. He was, I think, widely considered a hero. I'm not exactly sure the details of his service, but he was like, yeah. you know, he ran a lot on his uh, his military experience and whatever he ended up doing. So yeah, I mean, I could see him sort of like identifying with the Patton character. You know, given what we know about his sort of, you know, being tough on crime and being uh, very much in support of the war, 
And yeah, I mean, based on the Nixon land excerpts that I was reading, he would play this like nonstop. Like he watched it multiple times a week. Yeah. Um, and like, yeah, I find this fascinating that like a piece of pop culture can like be so captivating to a U.S. president and can sort of motivate them to you know, pursue different kinds of policies or, or, or I guess like sort of shore up, shore up support or, or belief in their own opinions about the way things should be. Yeah. Well, and the just, pop culture like, thing of, the, of Nixon land is really cool because it, it's not the only one. There's, there's like some mm-hmm. shows about, there's like, so, you know, Archie Bunker, I never, I never mm-hmm. watched the episode of Hall in the Family, but this is my understanding that it was supposed to be like a mockery of like bigots. And then the bigot became the, the hero. Um, and then right. the uh, Nixon apparently Nixon apparently yeah there's a there's a, a scene from the book where Nixon's flipping through the channels and catches Ar- Archie Bunker and like is scandalized that they show like homosexuality like there's a friend who comes out to him and Nixon says you know this is the fall of civilization uh, <laughs> oh, and then there's this other, there's even like more hardcore stuff there's like one it was like it was it was a there was a novel or there was a movie I think called Joe and apparently there's this guy named Joe who's like anti-liberal and like goes crazy about like hippies and starts like murdering them and he's supposed to be like a bad guy but like becomes like a hero to like many Americans. There's, <laughs> so. like a, there's a term for this. I can't remember. It's on like uh, TV tropes, the website or something. Like there's a term where like, you know, the, the, the creators of a piece of art or culture, you know, it, it, they, they intend it to be a critique, but then the people watch it and they end up actually liking it. Right. Yeah. And I think, I think the critics saw um, Patton in this way. They thought that the producers and creators of Patton meant it to be a parody or a satire or something. And that's why they heaped praise upon it. But then the people watched Patton and they took it like at a very like superficial, shallow, you know, like, oh, this is just like a fun, fun war movie about this great historical figure. And they just fell in love with it. And I see this happen a lot with like different kinds of like different movies. Like one thing that jumped out to me was a um, Wolf of Wall Street. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, like Martin Scorsese was like, you know, and DiCaprio and all the people involved with that movie were um like basically saying like this guy is evil he's like a sociopath who's trying to get rich at all costs and rip people off and whatever and a lot of like regular like you know normies or whatever watch wolf of wall street and they're like jordan belfort is the shit like this is cool like i love this yeah. it's so fun and entertaining and i think like this is a this is like a, a fine line for like artists to try to to try to write here of like you know, trying to appeal to the elites and to the people at the same time by like creating a satire of a of, of a certain kind of person that regular people find appealing and that cr- critics are disgusted by, but they like the sort of over the top, like exaggerated parody of it. And yeah, it, but but the people end up liking it anyway. Yeah. So do you see anything anti patent or anti like world anti war in the movie? Um, not well, not really. I I didn't really see any. I mean, I guess one one possible interpretation that could be anti-war is that again. So apparently, Patton, the real Patton, was uh, slightly more complex as a human being. And for example, he did legitimately regret slapping that soldier supposedly. Whereas the movie painted him in one direction, right? Like they they just showed the sort of most like overt, exaggerated, patriotic, right wing kind of guy. Yeah. And I guess like one could argue that this is anti patent because they're not showing all of the layers of humanity and complexity of him. But I don't really know. Like, I, yeah. I, what I don't about, know when, he, really about when he's he's racing the uh, British uh, guy Montgomery uh, mm. to, Mes- to Messina in, uh, uh, in uh, the northeast of Sicily? And basically mm. Omar Bradley is, you know, the other the other general who's sort of like the conscience of Patton and he's telling him basically he's trying to get people killed so he can like get the glory of taking mm-hmm, Messina mm-hmm. before the, before the British. Right. So this is like, yeah. this is, you know, not a, um, not a sympathetic portrayal, right. That the fact, you know, I think, I think you're supposed to think that yes, Patton is right. Patton wants to conquer Messina uh, because he's the, um, you know, because of his ego, but he's, you know, willing to get a lot of people killed to do it. Yeah. Yeah. That is interesting. And, and that something like that, I can see like a critic watching that, and saying like, oh, this is a commentary on a certain kind of person, a certain kind of mindset, like pro-war is, you know, misguided or whatever. Um, yeah. Well, so, other, so, yeah, but, but the, well, the other the intent, part, though. Yeah. The, well, the other interesting thing is when he, the, the soldier slapping incident, like, so the Germans hear about it 
and then mm-hmm. I think it's Keitel. It's what it's one of the you know the German the top officers, and he's and he's like uh, you know the, the, his assistant or whoever is like oh they, they you know they pulled him because he slapped a soldier, and then he's like ah oh, yes <laughs> yeah. you think Americans will pull their you know top general because he slapped you know a private that was such a funny scene yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so like, don't be naive. Like this is obviously, uh, you know, propaganda from the other side. Yeah. So, so the Germans in that scene didn't believe that, you know, the American leaders would, would pull their best general over something like that. I mean, I, I think today, like, would they, would they, I don't know if we, if we went to war today with any, you know, I guess any military, like, I, I think they could believe it today that we would do something like that. Yeah. But back then, I don't think so. Right. Or what, what do you think? Like today would, would, um, you know, one of our adversaries, if we went to war, would they believe that we would be willing to pull a general just for being insensitive or unkind? Yeah. I think, you know, they, I think other countries like differ in the amount of, uh, sophistication they have of understanding the u.s like i think the russians are pretty good you can see this in propaganda like russia versus china like you can tell russia understands uh the u.s um you can tell like the kind of people they have on like russia today like are the kind of people who sort of like have a constituency like on the far right or far left and if you look at chinese propaganda it's just like broken english just like repeating what the new york times says like according to you know this study america is racist and has police brutality (laughs) It adds nothing. It's just, it's just like they took the New York Times and like put it in broken English. That is fascinating. I have seen like the, you know, the Chinese affiliated state media and reading them. And I, I always wonder like, oh, this has got to be like, because, you know, the Chinese, they're supposedly they're smart people. They select their elite, their elites in a certain yeah. way, like, you know, better than we do in some 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 uh, domains. And yet their media and their propaganda is so uh, shoddy. And I wonder, like, is this 4D chess? Like, are they trying to like bamboozle us into sure, thinking they're dumber to be than they really are? Yeah, maybe. But but I don't, yeah. It, but but then, like again, like you said, like like Russia Today and some of the the Russian outlets, like isn't the Epoch Times also Russian or am I? No, no, mistaken? Epoch Times. No, you, the Epoch Times is um is I think it's the it's sort of it's anti China. It's like some anti China. I think it's um uh, Fulan Gong. If Fulan, if I'm saying that right, that's like a that's like a, a religious cult in China that's very anti Chinese government. It's anti Chinese. So yeah, okay. exactly. So that, that's it. Uh, the Fulan. Uh, uh, Fulan, Fulan Gong, yeah, uh, yeah. That, that's who. That's who controls it. And so it's like it's like a very right wing. It's like become like it's become like assimilated into American right wing culture. So it'll mm. become you know it's like it was like pro Trump and it's like you know anti you know abortion and all the all these other things uh, just because it's anti it's anti CCP. Um, so the, yeah, mm. that's the Epoch Times. So that's a, that's like a um, yeah that's a foreign run, but also like you know very well integrated within the American conservative movement at this point. Um, yeah, so it's, yeah. basically, it's basically part of it, but yeah, R- Russia and then Russia today and then like Sputnik and, but like, if you've seen like Iranian, like press TV, um, it's also, it's, it's closer to China. It's not very, but you can understand nobody thinks Iranians are like super competent, you know, they're competent probably compared to some other Middle Eastern countries, but they're not, you know, the Chinese are, are supposed to be super competent and they also, you know, their propaganda, uh, is very, uh, bad. Um, yeah. so yeah, I think the Chinese probably like, who knows how they would see America because I don't think they understand, they don't seem to understand America very well at all. Um, mm-hmm. the Russians, you know, even like Russia today, you get, you get like, you know, they're, they're co-opting like a lot of the anti-woke stuff. And so like they, they get it. I think they get that there's this thing called, you know, wokeness and like mental health and sensitivity in America. Uh, so yeah. they would understand it, but you're right. In, so when uh, Russia sees like, you know, the U S appoint, uh, like a transgender woman to be a, I don't know, what is she like a general or an admiral or something like that? I, I, she's like the highest ranking transgender person ever. And Russia sees it versus China. Like they have different views about that. Yeah, or? I don't know. I don't know how China sees it. I mean, I think they, they might be just completely like, I think that if anything, they probably like buy like the New York, like, you know, it's very strange. Like, I think they buy the New York Times line on like race stuff. But like on transgender mm. stuff, like I think they just, I don't know, I think they just shrug their shoulders and see this as like sort of a Western thing. Well, like I think Russia could like understand it in the context of of the American culture or like liberalism run amok or something like that, or like that's their their interpretation of how they see it. And yeah, yeah, so so they have a better feel for it. That makes sense. I mean, like Russia is sort of culturally closer to you know Western countries in general. Yeah. Versus, versus versus China, which is and there's like very, this, there's very a sort different. of Asian European thing where like you know it's just like East Asians in general are like better with technical things than they are with like words. So like if you look at their yeah. like representation in science and engineering versus the you know Asian representation in uh, 
in like, like uh, cultural law or yeah, culture, especially, yeah. but even like law, anything that's more verbal, you know, requirement than, than mathematical. So you can understand how the Chinese government is sort of like this extreme version of this, where they're like very good at like building, you know, bullet trains <laughs> and like just what, has uh, the worst. But like, I'm Canada curious what their like, test selects for, right? Because they have a test, right? Apparently there's some kind of like special test to like enter the, the ranks of the elite and go to like the best universities. I wonder like what uh you know like what subdomains of iq or whatever are they selecting for there like is it is it like very like visuospatial like mathematical not yeah. so much like logical or verbal i've been uh, trying to find i've been yeah I, somebody pointed me once i've had a chance like if somebody pointed to me once to i think uh like the civil service exam like uh, i think it had like a translation of it somewhere um i got yeah i've got a i've got to look at it yeah yeah that's 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 interesting so yeah so the germ i mean the germans like yeah people's ideology you know shapes so like the you know the nazis are you know they probably they have no clue what like american sensitivity is like and they, you know even if they did um you know like yeah so i mean like so, so yeah they i mean they they probably this is just sort of i think this worldview is sort of incomprehensible to them you know they want to they want to win the war um and they think the americans want to win the war and they care more than anything you know it's like the americans are in a different position so maybe this explains like the british why they're executing like deserters and the u.s is not like the america was never existentially really threatened we had less by, at stake yeah. yeah so we can be more sensitive like get rid of our best general uh you know because you know because he slapped somebody and like you know we, we could do that well you know the british probably did not feel uh that they could do that um well they were already like like getting bombed on a daily basis and yeah. like yeah they wouldn't have uh, they wouldn't have pulled their best general out montgomery or whoever because he slapped a soldier they just couldn't afford it right whereas the u.s sort of the more comfortable you are like the 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 more you can like yeah interestingly the more comfortable you are the more you can like attempt to like live up to your ideals yeah. whereas when you're under under pressure and like death is at your door you can i mean often you have to sacrifice some of your values yeah, to, yeah. to survive exactly and it's like this when like you see like a regular army versus a guerrilla army like a regular army can like you know respect human rights and like use smart bombs and stuff while a guerrilla yeah. army can't fight by the same uh, methodologies or they're just you know they'll get crushed if they if they you know use the same considerations um so yeah this if you're like completely ruthless like germany and japan like I, I think they they wouldn't have pulled a general no matter what their situation was like even if they were at a, like an immense advantage like you know yeah. I, yeah. I think they, they would have just had a completely different uh you know, a different yeah, that, that's right. Although, I mean, there was always, yeah, there was always these internal in both countries. There was always these internal debates. Like, there was a, a really strong constituency in Japan for, like, you know, uh, uh, you know, having Asia rise up against the white man and, like, you know, making, uh, uh, you know, making an alliance with them. So they were the first ones. They gave Myanmar independence and they tried to like mm -hmm. support independence in India. And so the idea, you know, that I think that I think at one point they promised independence to the Philippines. So they were they were doing this, you know, they were they they were trying, you know, but, but like they would have other people who were just like brutal to the natives. So like they had these different like factions of the army who were trying to do it. It was the same thing with Nazi Germany about whether like you should just crush the Slavs or you should try to turn them against uh against Stalin, who you know they all they, they hated in like the Ukraine. Um, you know, this was this was also another another debate. Um interesting. So, so yeah, I mean, the, the, these internal tensions, you know, were there even, even in those, gov in those governments. Um, yeah, the, uh, you know, the, uh, speaking of, you know, the Russians, Patton at the end when he's like, uh, uh, you know, when he's, when he's, hanging, he's like, he he's on the white life. horse, he's on the white horse, like, just so, you know, like, like trotting around. Are you talking about the end when the journalists are asking him questions, right? I'm, I'm, I'm talking about before, a little bit before that, when he's like, he's like having uh, like a banquet with the Russians. Oh, right. Okay. And he uh, he like refuses to he like he calls him like a, he calls one of them a bastard or something, mm. and then like and then like you know they cling they, you know they they're drinking oh, together the other guy. one bastard to another or something like that right yeah and then they, yeah. they then they left but at the same time you, you could tell you know it was funny the funny scene actually with the with the, with their, with the the banquet and like the Soviets like there's the the Russian dancers right and like the Russians are just like really into it and like the. Um, and like the American generals are all like looking at each other, like you know what what, what is this weirdness, right? I don't know what it was. I don't know what it was like. The uh, I thought that was very fascinating because like what did they? What do you call that dancing? Where like you know you're bending, you're like uh, you're like uh, you're like uh, uh, you know how like you're kicking and you're moving and you're jumping and you're like going down, you're squatting down and you're going up. You know that Russian. You know what I'm talking about, though. Right? Yeah, I, I do. I don't know the name of it, but I know like well, yeah, the, the kind of dancing. Yeah, it's called, but, but uh, yeah. It's, just, it's like a traditional, it's like a Russia traditional dance. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, 
um, you see, you see it. And like, they're, uh, you know, they're, um, uh, you know, they're, uh, you know, like the Americans are like, freaking, I wonder what, well, like, what's this, what's like the role of this in like the 1970, like Penn movie? Like, what are they saying about like Russia or like American attitudes towards Russia? Were they Did supposed we... to like signify, oh, these are like very ba- backwards people, something like that, like sort of the, the cultural primitivity of it or something. Um, yeah. yeah, that's an interesting point. I, I hadn't, I hadn't connected those dots there that, that the, the, this movie was made in the 1970s. And so of course they're going to um, make some subtle commentary about Russia as well and Patton yeah. himself being very anti-russia which i found interesting like the movie doesn't really explore why Patton has such hostility towards the russians who at, at that point were ostensibly our allies right and yet like you know what, what, what did some one of the journalists asked him like you know general Patton, like he said that if you were you know flanked by the russians on one side and the germans on the other you'd attack from both ends or something yeah. like that like he was very like at, at least as much uh didn't he say something at the end too about like how we've been fighting the wrong people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because what we should have made alliance. We should have taken the ice. And, and then he says we should take the. He's like, I think he's actually arguing for taking the Germans and like keeping them intact and and then going and fighting the Soviets. Yeah, <laughs> we're fighting the wrong people. Like, yeah. So I didn't know. Like, oh, was he actually sort of sympathetic towards? I mean, I don't think so because he was very anti-Nazi throughout the film. But uh, it seemed like he actually hated the Russians more. No, this um, is this is not. Yeah, this is not. I mean, that's surprising if you can understand the the, the context. Like, in a right wing American would hate, you know, the Soviet Union. I mean, that is just, you know, that, that that's easy to understand. So there was, you know, a huge red scare in like, you know, the nineteen uh, nineteen twenties, right? It, it was seen as sort of the end of civilization yeah. when uh, the Bolsheviks took over Russia, and the U.S. didn't even uh, didn't even um, establish relations with them um, until Roosevelt in nineteen thirty three. Uh, so the U.S. Mm-hmm. just had no relations with Russia. I mean, they they you know they were anti. And so the anti-war movement in the U.S. was right wing before uh, Pearl Harbor. They saw uh, they saw communism as just as bad or worse than than Nazism. Um, mm. And so it wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't surprising to me that um, Penn really, really hated the Soviets. Um, mm. And then like, you know, that he sees them and I mean, then they take over like, you know, half of Europe. So it's like, you know, got to be very scary at that point. Um, but yeah, the. Yeah, the other thing where they they comment on their primitiveness is like I, when they're like passing out hors d'oeuvres or they're passing out food, and like the Russians are just like indulging in it, and then like mm. one of the American generals like uh, just takes like a little piece, and then like Patton or one of them looks at him, and he's just like he just gets scared and like puts it back. Did you did you notice that part? I, I noticed that too. Yeah, and it, it, it like so what what was that though about like don't you dare eat their food? Like don't don't try to like you know accept their hospitality. Yeah, it was something like that. Because then, then he won't, uh, he won't drink. You know, then he won't, then he won't drink. But then eventually he does. I'll take a toast. Yeah, yeah. And then there's a, um, there was a Russian woman too. Like she was supposed to be like sort of. It's funny because during the Cold War, people say like the, the used to be the stereotype of Russian women was that they were like you know big and burly and like sort mm. of scary looking. And this was like apparently in the seventies and eighties, this was like sort of the stereotype. And like today, like it's like exactly the opposite. But I think there was like there was like some scene where like there was some uh, am I remembering this correct? There was like some Russian woman and she was like acting. She would look like sort of like an ogre and like you're supposed to like you know you're supposed to see that stereotype too. Am I remembering this right? Do you? Do you oh know yeah, I think you're yeah 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 I do I, I, vaguely. But but yeah, they were trying to reinforce. That. I think like just in general, the movie was trying to what like reinstill the 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 view that russia was a bad place right like you know they're, they're evil their their women are ugly the food sucks yeah, like they dance you know, they're just as bad or worse than the nazis yeah. they dance they're just like a, a a backwards primitive unpleasant culture right and yeah and i wonder like yeah like so so the movie took that opportunity to sort of like propagandize yeah. and reinforce the the, the 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 boundaries between the u.s and the soviet union at that time yeah right so yeah the two things i mean the two things that are contemporary are i think vietnam who knows if this was in the minds of the um, of the producers but this was a nixon's yeah. this was certainly in nixon's mind um and then the uh and then the other one was um uh yeah and then, and then the soviet union which would have been a more constant issue that was on on everyone's mind, which Nixon actually, you know, like, uh, you know, was trying to do arms control and stuff. So his you know, legacy is sort of uh, complicated. But yeah, the, you know, the idea was that basically, yeah, I mean, it, it, as you could see, like, this is, you know, this is like what Americans, what, what conservative part of America wants to see in 1970. They want to see the uncomplicated war. 
like the bad guys are are really bad. They want to see where like American masculinity is like going out there and just getting things done. And then like, yeah. you know, if there's a lesson, it's like, you know, the it's the, the the Russians are still there and like we didn't finish the job and like let's let's like you know continue <laughs> like you know struggling against yeah. these, you know, the, these forces today, right? Yeah, right, right, right. And that's what Vietnam was, right? Like Vietnam, what it, it you know, was at that time, uh, sort of uh, t- like taking that next step and and eliminating the Soviet Union or taking them out uh, through these, this kind of a uh, proxy war. And so it, I guess, yeah, in a way, you could view the film as sort of propaganda uh, for for the Vietnam War for US involvement in Vietnam, um, through like, using Patton. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What about the Brit- what about the stereoty- the British sort of the British look like sort of a, uh, I, I think they're they're pretty negative towards the British too. Don't don't you think? Uh, I I mean I thought they were you know sort of bit players. Uh, I mean, there was that scene where Patton gave a speech, and. I mean, this isn't directly related to, to how the British were portrayed necessarily, but he was in Britain when he gave the speech oh, yeah. and he left out the Russians, right? Like he talked about the Americans and talked about the Brits, but left out the Russians in terms of like, you know, um, like like who's, winning the war. Yeah, who's going to who's gonna be like the, the leaders of the world? Inheriting the world, the leaders of yeah. the world. And so he included the Brits there. And like, I think it was like a night, you know, whatever, like, I guess the, like if a British person is viewing this, they might think like, oh, this is, you know, the Americans are, you know, like our, our allies, they're good people, whatever. But the Russians, you know, intentionally leaving them out was like yet another sort of, uh, you know, poking them in the eye. And yeah. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. how did you like, did you think the Brits were portrayed unfairly? I think Montgomery was like uh, portrayed very negatively. I think, you know, there was, I think there's this sort of this idea that they're a little bit, um, no, maybe it was just Montgomery. Maybe, maybe it wasn't the British in general. Cause I think the other British came across, you know, they came across fine. Um, mm. The uh, yeah, the um, yeah, the, uh, you know, like the, the other, I mean, the, do you think it's like, yeah, I mean, the, there's a little bit of a hagiography to it. So like Patton's like um, obsession with like history, right? Yeah. You know, I think you're, you're, the, the German guy, like there's the German guy. I don't know if that's based on a real guy. I, the, you know, the, the guy who was like studying Patton. Um, yeah. And he, uh, yeah, and so he's like, you know, he's a man of like, he's a man of ancient like sensibilities and like the modern Like a man times. out of time. Different yeah. Era. He was kind of a mystic, right? Like he would talk about how he was, he, you know, he was like walking through Sicily or something. And he was like, I've been here before. Yeah. Something like yeah, that. Like, you know, he, other, he envisioned like, himself as yeah. like an ancient Roman warrior. Like, re, like he believed in reincarnation. I think the Germans discussed this, right? Like he believes in reincarnation, like yeah. very, uh, like there's a sort of mystical quality to him. Um, yeah. 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 That was interesting. And, and, and like he, yeah, even, it's interesting because like we view people from World War II as like you know these sort of um, like like in a in an aggrandizing way like we admire them, exalt them, and so on. But even back then, Patton felt like it wasn't enough for him. You know, even the level of patriotism and and pro war sentiment and all of this stuff, it, it, even then, he felt like it was lacking. What do you what, what do you think that's what what makes you say that? What seems well, I just mean like like today when we look back at World War Two, we think of it as like a very sort no, of but what, what do you think? What, what why was the pen in the movie sort of uh, like desponding over the lack of patriotism? No, not necessarily patriotism, but just like pro like pro war. Like you know, I think he felt like he was being like reined in. I mean, of course, like having to issue yeah. that apology, uh, at least you know as it was portrayed in the film um you know sort of sort of racing uh montgomery to to sort of take over different territory and i think he just felt like uh and and like his discussions with with omar bradley i think he felt that like omar wasn't like all in on the war Mm. uh the way that he was um and and yeah like you know we didn't finish the job against against the soviets right like yeah there wasn't enough for him yeah yeah, I think he would have, you know, he, so he, yeah, so he dies. I mean, very, he dies in, in the end of 1945 in a, in a accident. Um, oh, really? I didn't, I didn't realize so soon after. Yeah, let me see. Uh, Pat, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's uh, Pat. What was the cause of death? 
It was just, he was in a car. I mean, he was in a car. So you see that scene at the end. Yeah, December 21, 1945. So you see that scene at the end where he like almost gets run over. And I thought mm. they were—I thought they were going to kill him in the movie, but they don't. They, they, mm. he almost gets run over. Like, ha! Wouldn't that oh, right. be funny? You know, if I died, like, you know, I was run over by a cart or something. You know, after all I've been through. But he does right. die that way. He dies like he—he he, like gets in like a car accident in Europe, um, and oh, actually does die. So they don't—they don't show that. They don't show that, but they show like this near-death experience. So I was, you know, I was really confused what was going on with that. Mm. That scene where he, um, they were they were in North Africa and the Germans start start bombing them and he like starts running in the middle of the dirt road with uh, with the pistol firing at the at the planes above them. I mean, what were they like B seventeens or something? And yeah. like what <laughs> did that really happen? <laughs> like was that like dramatized for the movie or like was he really like on that level of like self confidence bordering on delusion? to be like yeah. firing a, a pistol at, at airplanes. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, there was, um, I read the, the part of his memoir that it talks about that. I, they, they don't, ha- he doesn't talk about firing at airplanes. He does talk about going out and like getting a, try to get a good view um, of mm-hmm. like what's happening. I think, I, I think I, I think I, the, what I read, I think was the seed, you know, was, was what the scene was based on. Um, mm. And no, he doesn't, uh, you know, he doesn't. Uh, he doesn't. He doesn't mention that. I think I would have remembered that. No, he, he doesn't mention that. I don't know if that's true. Yeah, that might be a, a dramatization. Um, the other thing, the, the other thing that's really funny in the uh, in the book is like he really hates Sicilians. Like he keeps like I'm gonna I'm, I'm, by the time this comes out, I'm gonna I'm gonna post photos of this on Twitter. But he's just like you know they're somehow the dirtiest of all Italians. Like if such a thing. <laughs> so he's got. Wait a minute, why? Uh, I don't know. He just says like the way they're living. Like he says, he says, he says at one point like they had a uh, like like he knew one who like who had like a corpse living in their house for a week. He says they were too lazy to like take it outside. And he says the uh, he says you know that even though the Sicilian does nothing but sit around all day, he never thought to like invent comfortable chairs. So he's like really hateful. <laughs> and he's like he's like he, it's and so they make this tomato sauce. And he like the way he describes it is like they take out this tomato sauce and they like they to, they ferment it by like just putting it on a door or like putting it on the street or something and then they take it and then they eat it so he's like grossed he's really grossed out by them um and then uh. there's one where he's like he's like the Sicilian loves to sing all day and like but he his diet is like all garlic so like they're belching they're like belching out all day and they're like you know the air is full of garlic so it's like he's like really hates them he keeps going back to it it's really funny um, that's hilarious oh he, man yeah and he compares he says the arabs are like he's he's like more like sympathetic to them he, he, he's not in the like he's, he seems to like you know he doesn't have like any of those kind of terms he like just he has a whole like a, a chapter or a letter called the arabs and it's much more balanced um hmm. and even yeah he, he, he's you know he compares the uh uh sicilians unfavorably to the arabs in, in north africa uh at some point um but yeah it's, it's really it's, it's a really funny it's really funny how yeah how uh yeah they didn't have that in the movie that, that was, that well, was they showed him nice, like with nice. with um, where were they like in Morocco or something? You could see that like Patton had a lot of respect for them and their culture. Um, yeah, but you don't really see his uh, you know his his less less favorable yeah, views that's like Sicilian about, bigotry. About Sicilians. That would have been so funny, man. <laughs> like if they had put something in there like that. What's it? I, I just this this came to mind was uh, you know Tony Soprano loved World War II like documentaries yeah. and, and he 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 watched a lot of stuff about Patton right like he'd yeah. sit in front of the TV with his bowl of ice cream watching Patton and they're like yeah uh, apparently Patton was not a fan of his although Tony wasn't Sicilian was he I think he was from um, uh, Naples his people well, Tony uh, wasn't like Sicilian that. okay I don't think he was Sicilian uh, his his uh, compatriots were I think uh, Big Pussy his 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 uh, lineage stem like stemmed from Sicily but but yeah. Uh, was it uh but, yeah, but in, yeah. in like the godfather movies you have to be sicilian to be a made man right is that right i yeah is, I that, is I that the remember. godfather I, I've never actually that, i've never seen the godfather good, films what really uh, yeah never seen the godfather movies it was good yeah. actually good fellow that was in good fellas might have been well you had to be it wasn't a sicilian i remember in the good in good fellas henry hill says you have to be full-blooded italian not, not no sicilian. no i think it's Sicilian. i think one of them couldn't be because he wasn't sicilian it wasn't italian right no, I, uh, was, henry hill and um, who's the other guy? Frank or whatever the Robert yeah, De Niro character. Yeah, made man. Uh, good fellas. Good fellas. It was. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was Italian, right? Yeah. I'm pretty sure it was Sicilian. And, uh, 
he and the De Niro character. Were okay, you're saying Irish. yes. Okay, so out of where did I get the Sicilian thing? You're right. Have to be full Italian, and then one was half Irish. Yeah. Okay. Could have been. Uh, could have been Godfather, right? Because they were like the, weren't the Corleones from Sicily. I I never actually seen the. Wait. The, okay. The so the Wikipedia it says made man. Traditionally in the American mafia, to be a made man, the nutty was to be a male of full uh, Sicilian descent. Soon mm. extended to males of full Italian. So the Godfather came first, and this might have been. Uh, I, I could be right. remembering the Godfather. I could have seen it somewhere else, but okay. So I guess by by Goodfellas, it looks like you're right. Um, yeah. Well, well, Patton would have been okay with the Italians, but not not with the uh, the Sicilians. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh, he says, uh, yeah, the uh, yeah. So yeah, so Patton, yeah, was not not. I mean, like on yeah, on other groups too. He was like, he but was he was cool. like his attitude seemed relatively you know modern or whatever. He had his like assistant who was a black guy, right? Like the sort of. Uh, I don't know yeah. who he was exactly. I mean, he was a soldier, maybe like a low-level, uh, like enlisted man. Yeah, his name was um, uh, Patton Assistant William George Meeks. Yeah, I don't know much about this guy. If it, if this will make if this movie, uh, what we do? Is that him? Wait, let me see. Patton Black Assistant. No, that's uh, uh, Charles. Goodman. Who's Meeks? Meeks was somebody else. Um, was, it Charles? was an American author, wine expert, and eight. Charles Goodman. No, that's that's the wrong black guy. Let me see here. Uh, there was a guy named Meeks, wasn't there? Let me see. I don't. Yeah, I don't remember the the names other than like the, the main characters. But uh, uh, George. Yeah, yeah I mean, George this Meeks. Guy was, was it I think George? George? It's George. Meeks. I think Meeks he used his first guy. name. I think he was on a first name basis with. Well, I mean, of course, he called him by, by his first name. Yeah, um, so this is orderly. Yeah, you know, if this movie was made in 2021, that guy would be like the whole movie, right? Like here, he's just, <laughs> it, well, the movie would be about him. Be, yeah, he'd, he, he would have been the main World protagonist. Yeah, he would have been yeah. the hidden, hidden figure behind the movie. The hidden figure, <laughs> <laughs> the hidden figure behind Patton. The the reason why we were able to take Normandy, like yeah, yeah well. Although yeah, I, don't, so, I don't think outside the South, I don't like, so Patton is from California. So outside the oh, South, he? I don't. I didn't realize. Well, well that's another connection with Nixon. No, he was Nixon Memphis? from California? Yeah, yeah. Nixon was have, from Southern yeah. California. Yeah. Okay. No, but he, but Patton mentions it in the movie. He, you know, when he's in the, when he's in the, um, like, field hospital, there's this Mexican. And he goes and he, he sits next to him and he says, you know, where you're from, son? And he's like, oh, you know, I'm from California. He says, me too. So he does actually mention it in the movie. Oh, um, right. Right, yeah, so okay. that's so another that case be of another... him being like, you know, a sort of anti-racist. You, you, you could imagine like in the 1970, there would be like a little bit of a hint of this. So like, you, you know, why did they make that guy Mexican? Like, you know, they'll, you know, they, you know, I think that they were trying to tell us like, oh, you know, we're all Americans. We're both from California. You know, we're all, we're all good here. You know, we're, yeah, we're yeah. And Patton himself, like, yeah, he was, uh, he was friendly to his, his assistant or his orderly or whoever this, this guy mm-hmm. was. Um, right, like like Patton could have had anyone be his assistant, but he chose this this black dude, and like yeah, they got along well, and so you know, I guess like Patton, even you, I mean, even back then though, I just feel like if you're like a, a like a seventy year old, I don't know how old he was in his sixties in the nineteen forties, you wouldn't necessarily like expect you know enlightened attitudes on race. But were there even any Mexicans in World War Two though? Like were there Mexican like Mexican American soldiers? I don't know. Yeah, I'm pretty like, sure there were. How, were there? Yeah, Mexican right, Americans. Yeah, why not? I mean, I, I mean, I just I never heard about it, and I don't think there were that many. Um, well, there weren't. There weren't tons of. So, according to this website called Los Veteranos, uh, there were over five hundred thousand Latinos in World War II. Yeah, why not? Why wouldn't they have been? Hundred thousand. No. Wow, that would be okay. I mean, yeah, I, like I, a lot of people served in World War II. It was huge. I mean, it was. Uh, yeah, but but I mean, at that time though, you know, America was you know, whatever, yeah. like overwhelmingly a white country with like yeah, you know, the, 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 the black ethnic minority. But uh, yeah, just, well, actually back then, probably Mexicans and Latinos were considered on the census as white, right? Like that didn't change until what, the 1960s or something? Yeah, right. No, yeah. The, the racial, or Hispanic they weren't categories. Considered, yeah, by the night, by 1970, you do have this idea of like uh, Chicano and like Mexican American. So like they wouldn't have, maybe they wouldn't have seen them as that different from Italians, you know, in the 19, in 1940, uh, 43 yeah. or 44. I think uh, they were, 19th, yeah, they were counted as whites, you know. Yeah, and like when they, 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 they were, and they mean they still are, just different with a different thing. Uh, you know, oh, right, not Hispanic uh, versus yeah. Hispanic whites. And... Et, 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 yeah, ethnicity. So, yeah, according to um, Wikipedia, 3% of the U.S. Armed Forces were uh, uh, Hispanic in uh, World War II, which, I don't know, sounds believable, I guess. You know, it's not a... Uh, it's not, it's not, a, I, mean, I think that's pretty keeping, I think that's pretty consistent with the, 
uh, percentage of the population. It's probably not too far off. Um, okay, interesting. So, so when uh, I, yeah, I there was remember a, there, there was a Cherokee. I mean, there was a Cherokee commander in the Pacific. Um, there were all there. these jokes um, in in Captain America. You know, the the first one I remember, uh, the first Avenger, or whatever. Like Captain America has his like multi ethnic, multi racial like ragtag band of soldiers. Like him and his like Bucky and those guys. Like, and I remember like people commenting like, you know, this is like revisionist history. Like in World War Two, you wouldn't have had like, you know, one of every race. Business? This was the first Captain America movie. Um, you know, he's in Germany, and he has there's like you know a black guy, uh, an Asian guy. Well, they're not they're not in, they're not integrated. At least the blacks and the whites are not integrated. I don't know the Asians maybe. I would yeah. agree. I don't know like what they did with them, but yeah, there, there yeah, wouldn't the, be an integration. The blacks and the whites weren't integrated, but but the it, it sounds like you know based on what you're saying here is that the the Mexican guys were like integrated with the whites, right? Yeah, like they, they were in the same. Uh, in the, they were in the same field hospital. I mean, so. Yeah, I mean, you didn't have enough. I, mean, you didn't, I don't think you had enough uh, Hispanics or Asians. But kind to of have like the racial country. dynamics of all this is fascinating. I mean, maybe someday we can we can do. A, I don't know. If, did you ever watch Sons of Anarchy? Uh, no. Should I? Yeah, like the first like three seasons, I think are are worth watching. Maybe the first four. Um, but like in in that motorcycle gang, which is loosely based on Hell's Angels, apparently like they have like these very interesting like racial bylaws about who can enter the motorcycle it's club just, you, so you just can't be black right you just can't be black yeah you can have yeah. like they had this is one one guy who's hispanic but he has like a black dad but his his like black hispanic and so there's this question about like well are you hispanic or are you black and that would determine his fate about whether he could remain in the it's like the, the mormon ch- the mormon church like, had this until 1978 or so yeah you could be any yeah. race to be a priest except black <laughs> That's like, this is, yeah, like very, yeah. Like where, where do these, like how, who determines this and how is this society and whatever, but. Yeah. Kaufman, Kaufman talks case. about sort of an American race is sort of seen as a spectrum where like white and black are like sort of the extremes. So like black, I think is sort of seen mm. as like one end of the spectrum. It, it, these are sort of, these are political labels to a certain extent. It's like when George Zimmerman, you know, it becomes a white Hispanic. So like you get this, you get this dynamic here <laughs> right. where it's yeah, like, yeah. It's like you're, well, you're, you're 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 setting yourself away from the mainstream, which is like so pro-black that you're like you become yeah. anti-black. So it's sort of like it's sort of like a yeah. It's there's you know there's a lot there. Um, well, there are like different uh, different directions that that are that that like like regular people versus elites are taking, where like elites seem to be um, adopting like more and more like anti-white or pro-black like sentiment, or at least like more ethnic, right? Where like. You know, like I'm seeing this like among Asian, Asian Americans, for example, where they used to, um, you know, if you were like fresh off the boat, you would give yourself uh, like a name, like, you know, you'd see this like very Asian person with a very thick accent say like, you know, my, my name is Jeremy or something, right? Yeah. Like this very white name. But now you're seeing like second and third generation Asians like give their kids very ethnic Asian names because they're trying to like. Is not that, I haven't anymore. seen that. Is, is, is that yeah, something yeah, that's happening? Slowly, yeah. At, at least among like certain what factions of like upper middle class upper upper income yeah. i don't know uh, how asians. many asians after three generations are still um are yeah are still uh pure asians i mean either they are very very high rates so, some of them yeah yeah but but not all and and even then they they still are like you know you sort of understand like which way the the, the at least elite culture which way it's drifting and uh you know having a Having a more difficult to pronounce name can be an advantage. Uh, in some I think cases. Asians are seen as uncool, though. I mean, I, I, yeah. So, like having like an Asian name, like the stereotype is sort of like I think Hispanic is cool, like black, like a Zulu name. Ibram Kendi apparently uh, changed his name. It wasn't that wasn't his original name. I was just looking at his website today, mm-hmm. and uh, so yeah, like that's cool. Hispanic is cool. I think like Asian is seen as sort of not as cool in American culture. Like the Chinese are not like, as you know, cool, but probably uncool. like considered less or whatever if your name is like, like, like you know like Xi Jinping or something like that um yeah. i don't think that's considered cool as like you know like uh i don't know like even like well, Miguel cool Alvarez, who, though. Huh? yeah i mean it depends on who we're talking about here like not necessarily in mainstream american culture but among like you know affluent upper middle class like sort of politically aware people to like i think i think Asia, know, i think those kind things. of asians i think they call their son like dylan some of them, well, that, like I think what I'm saying, what I'm noticing is like there's a shift away from that. Like it's it's pretty recent. I'm not sure if it's like completely widespread, but there is a movement away from that. Yeah, um, I think a lot of Asians. I think a lot of if you're if you're like sort of a woke upper middle class Asians, yeah. you are a little bit ashamed of the background because your parents and your grandparents 
um, are probably un unwoke. They're probably racist. They probably think you should like get a real job and not go into journalism <laughs> or, or whatever. There was a stupid show. There's a stupid, yeah. stupid show. I watch it. It's crit. It's like so cringe. It's called a million little things. It's so cringe. I just watch it because like, I, it's like a cringe watch. I'm like, I want to see what like normies are into. And they have this one Asian character. Um, and she's like discovering herself. So whatever. She's married to a white guy. She has a son. And she's like, she has her Korean mom and like, she's meeting other Asians and like, they're yeah. all like, you know, commiserating. They're like, you know, we're supposed to be silent. The model minority. That's what our parents' generation did. And like, you know, their parents are like, so this is like, if you want to watch like a show, like what like normies, like, you know, aspiring normies, like aspiring left-wing urban normies, like are thinking like, oh, I think a show no. like this is like pretty good. Um, and like the Asians are just like sort of cringing about like their parents and grandparents because they're like, you know, they're, they're, they're not like open-minded like they are. Um, oh man. Yeah. 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 I can, I can. Well, so, so I think the, like the people that I'm talking about are the people who don't have that connection, right? Like where they were born in America and their parents. So were long ago. Or they're so like it's so long ago that they don't remember the old country. They don't even speak the language. They're like almost fully assimilated. And now they're like, have this weird, like racial anxiety. And now they're trying to like, like whatever express it manifests by like making their kid like more asian in some way like to drift away uh, from i'll believe it, like, I'll believe it when like i see especially the name thing i will i'll believe it when i see because yeah. i think i think for this is like this is behind like their views on affirmative action it's like mm. those asians who are just like have asian names and do asian things and stuff they're just not cool like there's something they yeah. don't get about american society they're just like yeah. oh getting a perfect sat score they expect to go to harvard <laughs> like you guys don't not get anymore it. like, it's not, not supposed anymore. to be, yeah that's not supposed yeah. to be how it works so like there's this i think there's like yeah. if you're really tuned in and you're like elite, like very educated Asian. I think you're tuned into that. I think you're mm -hmm. you're trying not to be so. Uh, not to be Asian, Asian anymore. Knows? I mean, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, we we could see. Well, yeah, depending on what like what's what's going to happen with with Harvard and the rest of the those schools, like what they're going to do with the SAT, if they're if it's going to be like permanently eliminated. And I'll be very interested to see like how the how the demographics change or if they change at all. Um, you know, well, whether the number of Asians will, will continue to dwindle. Yeah, the, the, in California they might. California might see a revolution um, because oh, they yeah. got rid of a Harvard. Harvard is already. I mean, they're already doing Asian quotas. You see in the data where like all uh, Ivy League schools have you know ten to twenty percent Asian, while the Asian population like quadruples or whatever over a few decades. So, you know, so, so what got I'm wondering numbers. is like, are they going to remain ten to twenty percent? Like, is is Harvard going, going to remain just twenty percent, or are we going to see like oh somehow like by twenty twenty six Harvard's only like seven percent? Well, because America is only seven percent Asian, yeah. and so Harvard's like, well, we want to represent America, so we're going to make sure that Harvard's only well, seven percent Asian. Funny. That would be funny. It's <laughs> hard to incredible. like. The, the, yeah, that would be that would be really funny. Because yeah, that yeah. would be funny. I think I think the, I think the effect of this scannerized testing. So in um, so it's optional. So like, who knows? Like, if they're gonna, like, you know, like, or, like I think they're gonna have like boxes where like they're still gonna want to take a lot of smart people, and those people will submit the uh, test. Um, but yeah, they're they're getting more and more able to pick and choose on like politics and and race. They already do the race thing. I mean, they already get the bet. I, I assume whatever balance they have now, that's what they want. Like they, you know, if they wanted 5% Asian, if that was a good, they would do that already. I mean, they just say they all have bad personalities, so they can engineer 15%. They can engineer 5% if they, yeah. uh, if they want, it maybe makes it a little difficult because you have to discriminate against them even more, um, on the, on the tests. Um, but I, yeah, I think they, I think they pretty much, they are where they want to be with the race stuff. I think that they are, uh. They're going to change the composition. Like they're so going. Why to are they doing? Like why? Why eliminate the SAT then? I mean, I agree with you that like these schools are going to do whatever they want to do anyway. So so like why do we? You know, like why why would they need to uh, eliminate or, or or make make the SAT test yeah. optional? Well, in, in California, it's sort of it's California. It's easy to understand because they uh uh they, they can't officially use affirmative action. Um, and so yeah. like, even though they do, maybe they do like under the table, but they need to hide it. So they can more explicitly do what they want now um, in California. This is a public system. It gives them more freedom. Um, Harvard, I don't know. I mean, I think they're, I think if they, you know, they're just doing the woke thing because if they're going to get who they want anyway, you know, maybe there's just no cost to doing, uh, to doing the woke thing. Um, oh, interesting. Right, right, right. Okay. So, so yeah, they're going to keep basically admissions policies the same, but by, by like, you know, yeah, like, I don't think they're restricted now. Like, I think they are. Like, I think they're going to be more like the composition will stay similar, but like, mm. I think they're going to be able to. So, I mean, it, this is like a, we're off track, but that's okay. That's why people. That's why people listen to us. We can go in any direction we want. Um, the like, it's like you can still have like 
So you repeat, you, you report the 25th percentile and like the 75th percentile, right? Um, and so maybe like before you had 100% uh, submitting their SAT scores. Uh, now you have 50%, whatever, 60%. I think you're still going to, you're, you're going to report the 25th and 75th. They're going to look the same. They're still going to be the probably same 25th and same 75th percentile. But then you have 40% who are either, um, who didn't submit their scores um, or, you know, beneath the 24% anyway. And you can go crazy. You could just have like really stupid, like activists. And I think that like, you're going to get more of those people. Or David Hogg. Um, yeah, I think you'll get David. I don't know how stupid David Hogg is, but yeah, like people who like there's this one guy, there's this one uh, I think uh, Arab kid who wrote like you know remember this kid who wrote like Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter. Like, an essay like a thousand times and like they let him. I don't know if his SAT score was high or low, but like they want more. I think you're going to get more people um, like that, and so yeah, they're going to become more you know just more unbearable, and these institutions are just going to get worse and worse. I'm curious if like the impre- like you know I have seen some you know some of the conversations around this like what oh actually by the way some, somebody actually my my friend um uh, I think one of my I think uh, Charles Lehman might have told me this but one of the theories is that they're they're preempting the Supreme Court um it might do away with affirmative action uh and then if Supreme Court says you can't do affirmative action um then they can they they just make the whole thing subjective and they can continue doing whatever they want I think that's that's part of the, you know that that could be part of the calculation. Very interesting. Yeah, that, that's yeah, that definitely sounds plausible anyway. But uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, whether I, I'm curious whether the signaling value of, of these degrees, I mean, they've already been like somewhat watered down, but at least like, you know, a Harvard degree wasn't like a guarantee that someone was was smart, but it was at least a guarantee that they weren't completely stupid. Yeah. But like, will that change now that because now you don't know who, who submitted yeah. the SAT scores? Sure. I, mean, like, I wonder know, if it'll it change. Work. I mean, for the University of California system, because like there's a lot of schools in University of California. Some of them already have like poor uh, SAT scores. Like, you know, if you look at the Cal State schools, like they, you know, they're really yeah. bad already. I mean, you could just imagine them getting worse and worse. UCLA and Berkeley and even them could, you know, could decline. Um, yeah. And, you know, because Harvard is still going to get like the cream of the crop. Um, UCLA, I mean, I don't know, like the, you know, people want to be there, uh, Berkeley, you know, P, you know, it's probably not gonna, you know, it's probably okay. Um, the rest of the UC system, you know, might, it might be interesting to see if the, the values of those degrees, uh, drop off. It's, it's yeah. Possible. And whether anything will take their place, right? Like, will there arise like some, something to meet the demand for like employers or, or, or grad schools or whatever to like, know, like how, how competent are these people relative to others, right? Like that was one of the benefits of the SAT is like, you're, you're comparing everyone on the same metric. And so you, GPA is, is so unreliable. Whereas with, with the SAT and with standardized testing, you can at least like stack this person against like everyone else who ever took this test and you have some, some knowledge about their, their competency. And so, yeah, like, will there exactly. be anything? So it depends on like how real, like this yeah. whole system, is it all just BS and like status signal it? You know, it's like, is it's signaling just status or is it actually you know is there a market component of this where it's signaling something real and if that part gets is like the market robust enough to actually for this to actually matter and that's the question we're going to see you know in the next i don't know five to ten years or or so anyways um yeah yeah, i mean we've gotten sort of off from pen yeah we went on a long tangent there yeah Um, any uh any any final thoughts or comments or anything notable notable on pen uh, on pen i i i mean I don't know. I mean, okay, well, I will say that, you know, presumably a lot of people who are watching this have already watched the film, but if not, like, don't, I wouldn't be turned off by the, uh, the length, you know, when I, when you recommended it to me, I'm like, this movie's three hours long. It's from 1970. Like, you know, this is like, I didn't, I was like, is this going to feel like homework to watch this old film? That's three hours long. I was like, I was like surprisingly engaged the entire time. Like, this is a great movie. Um, Mm -hmm. surprisingly good. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, but it was just like, definitely interested to watch like sort of more old movies and yeah i like the movie yeah i like the movie too i I mean i like it as a history it's like what do people in 1970 think of like uh the 1940s so that's like interesting we're in 2021 we're watching 1970 referencing 1940s and we you know and also i recommend people read nixon land and if you are if you don't want to read the whole book uh just you know uh control f um pen and then find like the parts of it so you can understand sort of the cultural context of, of uh, what's happening and then you know watch it it makes it i think more enjoyable didn't nixon himself have a pretty high iq i remember reading somewhere oh, yeah. that nixon he was supposedly was, uh, one of the smartest right yeah they uh, they i think i think they 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 i did they iq test harm in, in the army i mean everyone just uh, nixon iq test oh right I think, was, uh, I think it was the military um uh yeah his asvab or afqt scores 
I'm sure they that that must be on file somewhere, right? I mean, oh, Nick T sells a bit. It's made to me too. Yeah, Nick like Nick's smart. Having... You don't need you don't need the IQ yeah. test. I mean, just people like I think everyone knew that he was like really smart for like obviously his his uh yeah. his, his knowledge of the issues and you know his ability to uh you know the, just sort of his, his political cunning. I mean, I think I think nobody did. did uh, Nobody doesn't think Nixon wasn't smart. So, I don't think yeah, like I military service is seen as an advantage anymore for for potential presidents. You yeah, know, it seems to be the case. Like Biden, right? Trump, yeah. um, Obama. Like literally, our last three presidents, no no military experience whatsoever. Yeah, I think people. I think people are sort of fed up with the. Um... You know, it's funny because like, yeah, because like in the 1970s, they're looking back and they're like, you know, they're saying they're I think they're like Americans in that time are like nostalgic for like the good war where like Vietnam seems complicated. And like, yeah. I think the wars have made even less sense uh, since then. Uh, yeah. So it's sort of like senior, sort of seen as like part of a, uh, you know, there, no, I think Normie still, it's still a positive. Um, but I think it's 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 becoming to be seen a little bit more like a sort of another special interest group. Like, okay, you're another former government employee. You have like this yeah. worldview and like you have these interests. And like you say, you're, you know, you're like a post office. Oh, obviously you like war. You want to stay in Afghanistan uh, because you're in the military. I, I think there's a, there's starting to be a little bit of that. I just saw a poll the other day, like, uh, American support in the military. Military is always the most trusted institution, but it's dropped yeah. by like It's 20%. declined a lot, right? Yeah, yeah I saw that exactly. too. It was and like 78% is- to like 58%. Yeah, and I think a lot of it's conservative. I mean, it's conservative. They they see the woke stuff, you know, going on, which they which they need to do, like because the Democrats control the you know the budget, and you know they need to they need to please the Democrats. So of course, it all you know they want to please the media too. So it makes uh, it makes sense. But yeah, the um, but you know the but like during the end of Vietnam though, like military is like the the reputation of the military was like the all time low. I mean that was like yeah. you know just a, a completely different time. So yeah, that's another reason they would have been they would have been more taken aback by the distinction between nineteen forties and their. That, I would love to learn more about that too, like the the impression of the military because like presumably like people sh- must have known like like a bunch of the the soldiers in Vietnam were drafted, right? And they were drafted from like the, the poorest parts of the, like the uh, poorest uh, brackets, right? Because if you were in college, right, you could defer. So these were like the poorest people in the country and they were somehow like being held responsible for, for going to Vietnam. Like why, like how, how did that happen that that blame, that condemnation wasn't directed towards the political leaders yeah. or towards the government? Like how did, like how is it that if you're like a 19 year old, like, I don't know, from the ghetto who like gets drafted because you couldn't go to college. Like somehow those guys got yeah. the blame for this. That didn't well, there was, there was, there was more of a culture of sort of mass resistance back then. So I think it was like more yeah. like people would actually do things that were, so like a lot of people ran away to Canada. So I think it, like a lot of people went to college and a lot of people were do you're actually committing violence against the government. Like we're like blowing up, like, you know, uh, ROTC oh, and yeah. stuff like that. So it, it was a sort of like, you know, if you hated the war badly enough, I think in the U.S., you know, you either resisted. Or oh, you, it was seen as like it. you, you, but yeah, but like, you know, so I guess like, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Well, we've never had a president who, who served in Vietnam. Do you think we'll right. ever have a president who uh, was a veteran of any of the, like, you know, a, a, any of the wars in Iraq or Afghanistan? I, I think probably not. So like, let's say so you, you could imagine, like, if you, if you think of like somebody, like they would already be like a political figure right so like dan crenshaw it's been like 20 years yeah. yeah oh yeah dan crenshaw Crenshaw's is. Like the most famous one tulsi gabbard but neither of those are going to be president um yeah so yeah probably probably not i think it's um yeah i mean to rise up in the military you need to be like so like there's a polarization of parties like you can't be like too right wing and you can't be too left wing i mean i think that's like sort of how the way you know, the, the, that's like the generals today. I think you have to be sort of centrist to play along. And yeah, will we ever have a general? Like, will Millie, like, like, was it Mike Millie or Mark? I can't no, remember his no, name, but Millie, yeah. will he ever, uh, you know? No, will he it's have become a more of a specialized sort of community thing rather than like a thing that were like unites the the country. That you know, that's what I like. It's not impossible, but like, you know, like, no, I, I, I don't think so. Yeah, I think it's probably yeah. These guys like McChrystal and. Uh, Mattis and yeah, it doesn't seem like they have like grand political ambitions the way that the generals right. of the past did. There was talk, like yeah, there was talk of, lived. yeah, there was talk of Petraeus at, at some point. He got then he got to, like caught with that affair. Uh, you're <laughs> right. Um, 
Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, the war stuff just doesn't inspire passions. Like you can't run like as a general and say, oh, I, like John Kerry became politically famous because he was in Vietnam and then became like an anti-Vietnam activist. And right. like, you know, being an anti-Iraq war, Afghanistan, it's not going to passion make people that passionate or like being p- too pro those wars, like isn't going to make people very, uh, you know, passionate about, you know, about you either. So it's, it's just like, it's like a, it's like, again, it's like, it's like a thing where like, nobody really knows like why we're in Afghanistan or why we're in Niger or whatever country and just like, oh yeah, support our troops. But it, you know, it's just, it's not seen as something that like affects most people or like we should like care that much about. Which may be why, why there was never a president from, from Vietnam, right? Because like, it wasn't clear like why we were there and like yeah. what Well, I mean, it, it just, it's just, it's just chance. I mean, John Kerry, you know, came close. He came within a few percentage points of of, of, you know, becoming president. So it's just, it's just, it's just a chance thing, right? It's a, uh, only a few people get to be president. I mean, he was the only one though. Like, I, the, uh, who came, came who close, came close? Right? McCain, 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 I mean, it was a nominee. He got, he got oh, crushed yeah, in the yeah, general, but, but it was, yeah. it was, uh, you know, the recession. And so there was a lot going on. And so like, yeah, yeah. Good, and an like, unpopular Republican president. Yeah. Before so him. It's not yeah. like it couldn't have happened. It was just, it just didn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. I just find it interesting that, uh, I mean, by now it's too late, right? Like, I don't think we could ever have a president yeah. who, who. Uh, although I, I guess Biden, I mean, he didn't, but he could have. Yeah, um, exactly. I mean, now there's not going to be there's, there's not going to be an even older Biden. Yeah, next time I think yeah, Biden is. I think we're <laughs> the, we're at the end of that generation. I think yeah, I think that's that's it. Biden is the current call. Maybe they but, can uh, reanimate his corpse for a yeah. third term. <laughs> all right, all right, Rob. Well, yeah, this was fun. I enjoyed Pat. Yeah, I will put the I will put the links to. Uh, uh nixon land i'll put the links to some other stuff in the comments and uh yeah until next time this was fun all right sounds good thanks richard